Hello and welcome to EGM 702, Week 4, Part 5, Time Series Analysis. So when we look at our satellite images or our different, different sensors and satellite missions that we have available, and we start to think about the temporal resolution of those sensors, uh, we have a number of different scenes or a number of different sensors that are requiring continuously, that is, they are... Uh, every time they pass over a point on the ground, they are taking an image of it, um, and we can look at the repeat times for those acquisitions. So, for example, the MODIS sensor uh, is carried on two different satellites, the Terra and Aqua satellites, and it has a repeat acquisition time of every one to two days. Sentinel-2 is carried on uh, the MSI instrument is carried on two different satellites and it has a repeat time of 10 days which because there are two satellites in opposing orbits gives us an image every five days although this is subject to cloud cover and as we get to higher latitudes so further up towards the North Pole or towards the South Pole uh, we have actually more rapid repeat times than this. For Landsat uh, the nominal repeat time is 16 days, again, subject to cloud cover, but this is also only true of the most recent Landsat missions, uh, as we get back before Landsat 7, and even really in, in a lot of the time that Landsat 7 was active, we don't have a, an acquisition every 16 days. That was a, a relatively late change to the Landsat mission, so... Um, you may find images back in the 80s and 90s where you have repeats that often, but that's more of an exception than anything. Um, two other sensors that we haven't spent much time talking about, uh, the AVHRR and the VIRRS uh, sensors. These are primarily meteorological satellites um, that have repeat acquisitions of less than a day in a lot of cases although they're very low spatial resolution, so these are um, on the order of a kilometer or so uh, spatial resolution. So it's not a, these are not um, necessarily that useful for some of the applications that we might be interested in. Other satellites that you can see here are not acquiring continuously, so each time they pass over a point on the ground, they are not taking an image unless they are being specifically told to, unless they're being tasked to take those images. Um, so, for example, the spot satellites are tasked, uh, all of the different worldview, GOI, etc., they're all tasked. They're not giving us repeat acquisitions unless that is part of the you know, current set of instructions that they've been given. So all of this is to say that as we've gone on in time, we've built up more and more of a time series of satellite images that we can use to do different analyses. Now a time series, as the name might suggest, is normally just a series of values of some variable at equally spaced time intervals. So for example here we see uh, we have temperature plotted monthly uh, between 1880 and 2016. Um, so those are the different dots that we see here. And these time series can have different properties. For example, the time series can be stationary. Now we saw this when we talked about spatial statistics, and this means uh, in, in the context of a time series, it means that the mean and the variance of the uh, time series are constant in time. So the mean and the variance are not changing um, at different points in time. Another way of saying this is that there is no trend present in the data, at least with respect to time. Uh, we can also think about seasonality, which is also just periodic fluctuations in the data. For example, temperature has a uh, periodic fluctuation where we have higher temperatures in the summer, lower temperatures in the winter. Um, these are things that we can examine or derive by looking at something called the temporal autocorrelation. So again, like what we saw with spatial statistics, if we plot the differences between different measurements in time, we can look and see 
how those things are correlated or if they are correlated. And one thing that we see with seasonal data or seasonal data that have seasonality is that there is a clear correlation at set points in time. For example, if we were to look at temperature, we would expect that temperature in June is going to be very similar even as we get further and further out in years than it is going to be with, say, June and December from the same year. So there's a, a uh, periodic fluctuation in <clears throat> there's a periodic fluctuation in the variance of the data um, as a function of time. So to actually start working with our time series, there's a number of different techniques or, or processes that we can think about. Um, the first of these is what's called a moving average. And this is where we're just taking an average of some number of uh, values. We then move on to the next value and take this, you know, move our window with us. Um, this is similar to how the uh, image filters worked uh, that we talked about last week. Okay. And so the idea behind a moving average is that the recent observations of our variable, for example, temperature, uh, have an effect on the current observation. So that is to say that, you know, the temperature in, uh, I don't know, let's say June of 1892 is going to be largely based on the temperature from uh, May of 19 or nine, May of 1892, April of 1892, and so on, um, moving back. Uh, this taking a moving average like this has the effect of smoothing the time series. So we've kind of uh, averaged over a lot of the very high frequency fluctuation that we might expect to see. And this is something that we can use to help uh, identify and highlight trends in our data, especially as we take longer and longer moving averages. Another technique is what's known as an exponential smoothing. Um, and so this is uh, something that takes a weighted average of the previous time steps. Um, so we're, we're building on this idea that our recent observations have an effect on our current observation, but we're saying, eh, you know, maybe, maybe those, um, maybe the more recent observations have a bigger effect than the um, than observations a little bit further back in time. The formula for this is given here. So our exponential moving average at time t is just a uh, combination of some parameter alpha times our observation at time t plus 1 minus alpha times the exponential moving average at time t minus 1. So this has the effect of uh, giving more weight to our recent data, and as we get further and further away, the actual impact of our earlier data effectively goes to zero. Um, so as we increase our alpha parameter, we smooth the data more and more. So this um, alpha of 0.3 gives us a very similar look to our annual moving average. So one thing that we're often interested in is doing some kind of trend estimation. And to estimate our trends, one thing that we, or to estimate trends in time series and in other things, one thing that we often turn to is linear regression. So we're fitting a line uh, to our data. We're trying to find some sort of best fit line. Uh, often we use a technique called ordinary least squares where we're just trying to minimize the uh, squared difference between the uh, between all of our data points and our line of best fit. Some problems that uh, come up when we're trying to do this sort of um, this sort of analysis. Uh, the first sort of problem that we have is that the trends that we're looking at might not be linear. So you can see here that a linear fit to this particular data set is not necessarily the best way to go. This also uh, can be because trends can change in time. So we might have a good linear fit to some part of the data, 
uh, but it might not be the same slope as a linear trend or a best fit linear trend at another point in time. A way to solve this or a way that we can help deal with this is by taking piecewise linear regression. So this is where we're fitting a line or fitting a best fit line to some part of the data, then to another part of the data, then to another part of the data and so on. So for example, we might say that, you know, this portion of the data, the best fit line looks sort of like this. This portion of the data, the best fit lines looks sort of like this, although they should ideally join up. One issue that comes out of this is the question of where do we actually choose the boundaries between our different trends? So where do we, f where do we figure out where to start a new uh, trend line or a new best fit line? This is related to something called breakpoints. Breakpoints are just where our trend is changing. So where we're, again, where we're breaking these trend lines. Uh, this could be because of, for example, looking at the NDVI plots here. This could be due to things like fire, uh, deforestation. If we're looking at uh, forests that are managed, this might be where we've planted new trees. We might see landslides, other other reasons why we might see a change in the trend of NDVI. Um, so this example comes from a paper that proposed a method for uh, finding breakpoints in a time series uh, or in, in time series data. Uh, the algorithm is called breaks for additive seasonal and trend or BFAST. Uh, and this is something that we will work with in the practical for this week. For a number of different time series applications or algorithms, um, the assumption is usually made that the, uh, that the intervals for our data are equally spaced in time. And you might remember from the first slide of this lesson, um, that's not always feasible with remote sensing data. We might not have acquisitions that are evenly spaced in time. We might have clouds that interrupt a time series of images. Um, we might have, if we're looking at uh, polar regions, we might have Arctic night or Antarctic night that interrupts our data series. Um, so this is not always something that we, we, we don't always have data that have an equal spacing in time. Now, if you think back to week two, uh, lesson three um, from a couple weeks ago, uh, where we looked at using the variance in data in a data set to interpolate or predict the values of that data set at unsampled points. And remember, this is a, a number of different techniques that are sort of all uh, lumped together under a label called Krieging. Well, we can also use Krieging to interpolate in time. Um, so we take the uh, the differences between whatever it is that we're trying to work with. In this case, it's elevation over glaciers. Um, we plot the uh, temporal lag, so the difference between different measurements. We look at the variogram. We attempt to model the variogram as a number of different um, components. And so this example here with glacier surface elevation, again, we're modeling the different variance components. And we can combine all of these together to come up with the variance as a function of time. And we can then use the elevation measurements that we have, which are very unevenly spaced in time. They have some uncertainty associated with them. And we can use the combination, again, of the data, the, the actual measurements that we have, the variance that we've estimated from the data to uh, to actually interpolate a time series in our data set. Um, so this example is shown here for one pixel over one glacier. Um, this example comes from a study that has uh, looked at doing this for basically all glaciers on Earth. Um, but this is one example where we can, um, we can use these sorts of uh, interpolation techniques uh, to help us to um, to help us to f interpolate values at times when we don't have um, when we don't have measurements and that we can then um, you know 
still work with the data as though they were equally spaced, or we can do other things like, for example, um, integrate all of these different time series to look at volume changes over time. To sum all of this up, remote sensing can give us very dense repeat observations and we can use techniques from time series analysis to help us understand changes in those observations. Often what we're interested in is estimating trends or especially changes in trends. So where uh, th those changes in trends are usually where something interesting has happened uh, that we're interested in studying further. This analysis can be very simple. Uh, for example, we can take just a simple moving average or compute a linear trend uh, or a linear best fit to the data, or we can get significantly more complex with techniques like temporal Krieging. I have some additional resources here for you. Um, Chapter 7 from Lillisand, Kiefer, and Chipman talks a little bit about time series analysis. Uh, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology um, have a good introductory website to time series analysis that you can have a look at. And I have a few different papers here uh, that talk about using time series analysis in uh, remote sensing data, including the uh, BFAST algorithm that we, uh, that we looked at on one of the previous slides. That's all I have for this lesson. I hope you found it interesting. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to post them in the discussion forum on Blackboard. Thanks. Bye.